Hello, everyone. I'm really glad to be here to talk about something that's a passion for me, and that's uh, range management. I've been involved with rangelands all my life. I was born and raised on, a <clears throat> on rangelands, and, <clears throat> and then uh, most of my professional career, uh, just a short stint with the Agriculture Research Service and then the Bureau of Land Management, and then over 30 years of experience with the Forest Service. We're going to need to use that. Okay, so uh, anyway, lots of experience on, on rangelands. I wanted to qualify that a little bit, though, as I don't work for the Forest Service anymore. This is my uh, eighth year at Arizona State University. I, um, so I don't really represent the Forest Service anymore, although I had uh, over 30 years of experience with the Forest Service, and that's definitely shaped the way I think about management and uh, the management of natural resources, the management of rangelands. And um, I learned from a lot of uh, people inside and outside the Forest Service, and so it was a wonderful experience. But anyway, now I represent uh, Arizona State University. So I want to talk about um, rangelands, and uh, I want to discuss the importance of these rangelands, the threats to rangelands, how ecosystems function. So I'll just take kind of a little side venture on and talk about uh, some basic ecology of rangelands, how ecosystems function, and then uh, that kind of sets it up for the uh, discussion about maybe how I feel like rangelands should be managed, uh, how open space should be managed, and uh, how ecosystems should be managed. So uh, to do that, I want to define how I'm using the term rangelands. And I'm mostly talking about lands that are undeveloped, uncultivated, um, so they're not cultivated or, or developed. They're basically natural areas other than uh, bare rock and ice and uh, lands that are covered by whatever, asphalt, uh, concrete. And so I'm talking about lands that you might, be, you might prefer to talk about uh, habitats or open space. Uh, so that's the general term that I'm using when I say rangelands. I'm talking about these, uh, these undeveloped and uncultivated wildlands. So anyway, to uh, put an emphasis on the importance of these rangelands, you probably have seen this figure. Um, it's getting to be kind of an old figure. Uh, uh, Jerry Holacek still uses this in his book, but 50% of the United States is rangeland with that definition. So that's a, that's a really big area in the United States that's uh, these undeveloped areas where we have our watersheds and our airsheds. Um, so 50% in the United States and about 70% in the world. Um, that's probably, that, that was the same figures that were used back when I first started studying rangelands, so I'm pretty sure a lot of those have developed and that, that figure is probably lower. But I'll talk about that in just a, just a second. So uh, anyway... Uh, rangelands are important, and I want to. Um, I'll, I'm talking back and forth about the you know, Forest Service rangelands and then rangelands in general, so just kind of bear with me on that, and I'll try to uh, let you know what I'm talking about a bigger, uh, a bigger area of rangelands and not just the Forest Service. But anyway, the Forest Service uh, administers about 191 million acres. And more than half of that, that's just talking about the Forest Service as a whole, more than half of that's rangelands. In the western part of the United States, much more, a bigger percentage of that is rangelands, all those Forest Service lands that are uh, west of the, the Mississippi. So the western, whoops, that wasn't good. This must be the pointer, there it is. So these, are, these lands in the western uh, part of the, the U.S. are lands that became National Forest Lands after the Organic Act in the late 1800s and the Forest Service Management Act. And then, uh, of course, east of the eastern part of the U.S. were lands that were acquired under the Weeks Law. And so there's a big difference, a lot of checkerboard pattern type lands on the eastern part of the U.S. So, um, so these lands, of course, are, are habitat. There's a lot of ecological services uh, from these lands. I mentioned air sheds and water sheds and wildlife habitat for, uh, you know, just about every organism that you can think of. Uh, the Forest Service website says 
or more than 3,000 species of wildlife, including uh, big game, uh, small mammals, songbirds, and fish. So uh, uh, more than 80% of, of all elk, bighorn sheep, mountain goats, uh, as have habitat uh, on these, uh, this is habitat for those species on these uh, rangelands on, um, on national forest lands. I'm just going to throw out that as far as public lands go, uh, the BLM is, of course, the biggest administer of these public lands with 47 percent. The Forest Service is second with 26 percent. And then the, the Fish and Wildlife Service is third with 12 percent. So this is a huge amount of uh, land that's uh, protected and managed with, uh, with law to preserve these as, as public lands uh, that are really important as far as our ecological services. So uh, as far as forests in uh, Arizona then, um, there's six forests, the Kaibab, the Coconino, the Apachisit Graves, the uh, Prescott, the Tano, and the, uh, the Coronado, for about uh, over 12 million acres, all the way from uh, about 1.2 million acres to almost 3 million acres of contiguous land. So I, I wanted to, uh, we're talking more about wildlife, but I wanted to have to mention watershed, especially for the western uh, rangelands and uh, the importance of these watersheds. Uh, this is just a statement about all Forest Service lands that the Forest Service manages the largest single source of water in the U.S., about 18 percent. Well, it's much higher than that, of course, as you can think in, in the western uh, United States. In fact, uh, 96 percent of watersheds come from our, from national forests uh, in the western part of the United States. Okay, so uh, now I want to talk about uh, threats to rangelands then. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of things that I have to say, I heard Rod talk about uh, threats in, in Arizona. Uh, and uh, we have the same kind of threats to rangelands that I want to talk about. One of them is that uh, just um, one of the threats is being able to keep these open spaces, to being able to keep rangelands, and uh, to avoid things like a and, uh, dry farming. So that's one threat. Um, I'm to press this too much because then it advanced more than I intend. So the loss of rangelands and open space, and we lose these by, uh, we've lost a lot of these lands by development, cities, uh, infrastructure, highways, freeways, uh, asphalt, uh, you know, the, uh, the fracturing of these uh, rangelands. And then by uh, one of the 40 acre jets that, are, uh, that especially see, well, around uh, more urban areas, but I see a lot of it around the uh, east side of the Rocky Mountains. In, in in, the, in Montana. Okay, uh, this is uh, some threats also that I see invasive species, of course, and I'm mostly talking about plants. And uh, the invasive species can also cause uh, a deterioration of uh, conditions of these rangelands, reducing uh, biological diversity, uh, causing a monoculture also. And then I just added in uh, a third one, drought, because drought can sometimes be even... Uh, you know, this is a natural event that could uh, a change. You know, if it's severe enough, it could cause a change in uh, a plant community, cause a change in uh, the use of that land that uh, takes a long period of time to, to overcome. They may have to use, leave the, maybe they can no longer afford to stay on the land, and so they've had to leave, and uh, maybe uh, if it's on private land, maybe that's been subdivided and developed as a result of that. So that could be, drought could be a real problem. Okay, so I wanted to bring up uh, the four that uh, I was dealing with when I was with the Forest Service, and that's uh, when uh, Dale Bosworth was the chief of the Forest Service. He came up with these, predicted that that would be, uh, these would be future threats that we'd be dealing with for a long time. And uh, so uh, fire and fuels, 
So uh, maybe the improper management of, and mostly he's talking about forested lands, but uh, rangelands also. And, uh, so the buildup of fuel, uh, the poor forest health. And uh, I used uh, kind of uh, uh, an example here, Penicetum ciliary in, in southern areas, north and causing uh, monocultures in some of these areas and reducing the diversity of uh, plant species. So uh, cities, this is around the, the Salt River now in, in Phoenix. And uh, this is uh, a problem with the uh, loss of open space. So I was reading uh, a publication that was done uh, by Macy Hannonson, and uh, she actually did a, some research for the Forest Service and looking at these urbanization problems around, especially around large cities. And so, and so figures that she came up with from 1945 to 1992 was uh, it was about two million uh, acres per year uh, that converted from rural to urban areas, and then just in a short period from 1992 to 1997, three million acres were converted per year from urban areas, and so. Uh, Accelerating type uh, increase in, in development of uh, clearing of these lands. With those figures along per person, she, she gave some figures and just just calculating uh, per person in the United States from 45 to 92, it was about half an acre per person. To, to the uh, rural areas that were cleared and developed and became urban areas, and then from 1992 to 197, there was uh, 1.2. Uh, acres that were developed. So that seems to be increasing. I'm sure about from that from then to now whether that is uh, you know that has continued or not I expect that it's starting to, to increase again. And then the other thing is and uh, we see it around here, see it on the tunnel. Management. It's not kind of some fundamentals of ecosystem management and uh, these components of ecosystems. Um, I use the, uh, the tundra here since uh, you know we didn't want to use the Sonoran Desert, especially right now. Overused that zone. But uh, how do ecosystems function? I just wanted to talk about that for a second, and uh, so bear with me and just keep these things in mind. So we know that ecosystems have these different; they're composed of these different uh, components, and uh, ecosystems have uh, abiotic components. So your your weather, your climate, your minerals. Your water are abiotic components, and uh, the biotic components, of course, are uh, the autotrophs, the, the plants, uh, and then the, uh, the herbivores, and uh, all those biotic components, microorganisms that uh, that make up this this landscape. And so, the important thing about ecosystems, uh, in the word system, it's uh, inferred is that the important thing is the inter uh, interconnectedness, the, the uh, all these components work together uh, to function for a, a larger uh, purpose, so it's like for a watershed or <clears throat> for providing habitat for uh, caribou or whatever it is in this uh, in this example. So, so all these. Oops. So this uh, this ecosystem has a composition. It has. Uh, in this particular ecosystem, it's composed of these biotic and abiotic components, the, the high elevation watersheds, the lower elevation riparian areas, where watersheds provide, you know, they keep, they store this, this moisture in the form of ice uh, during the winter, and then they release this down to the watersheds, and the watersheds act as a, kind of like a sponge, and they store this, uh, this water, slowly release it into the stream, and so that's, that's a, that's a function of these different uh, components. The structure is referring to where these different components arrange the landscape, or even sometimes ha when do they grow, when do the different types of plants grow, when do the different types of animals use these areas. So structure can be uh, location, uh, 
or it can be uh, time. And then, uh, and then function is, we're talking more about uh, function is, how, are the watersheds function? Is the hydrologic cycle working? Is the uh, uh, nutrient cycle working? Is there a flow of energy in these systems? And how is that all, is that working overall? And then I throw in uh, nature's disturbance regimes. I'm not sure all the textbooks do that. I know Odom back when I first took ecology didn't include uh, disturbance and uh, I include disturbance because, it, especially I think we learned a lesson with fire, it's so critical that, that fire has to be there in some systems like uh, fire dependent uh, uh, ecosystems or fire adapted ecosystems like in ponderosa pine or grasslands. If fire wasn't part of that, you'd have a different, it'd be characterized differently. You wouldn't have the type of plants that you have there now. So I included nature's disturbance regime. So that could be fire, it could be grazing, it could be uh, hurricanes, it could be vol volcanic eruptions, pretty severe, or more long term, <coughs> those kind of types of disturbances. So the other thing I wanted to lead up to is that uh, we know what these ecosystems are and we know that there's a lot of these important components in the ecosystem. Sometimes we don't know how important each of them are, but uh, using that Aldo Leopold's statement to, uh, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And so the way I take that is that uh, before removing something from this ecosystem, you need to know what what role it had, how what kind of function did it have in that ecosystem, how was it tied with other, some of those other components in the ecosystem. So basically everything that's in those ecosystems, uh, it that evolved, maybe it has a long-term evolutionary history of being in that ecosystem then it's probably important for some reason, even if you can't figure out what it is. And, you know, even, uh, I know, I, I use this example a lot in my classes, uh, <clears throat> the prairie dog, and my, my family felt like it didn't have any purpose on uh, rangelands, and uh, now I think at least they're starting to somewhat realize that the prairie dog is there for a purpose too, and, uh, and making that a more healthy ecosystem. So uh, <clears throat> I looked at this, and now, but now I decided to use the tall grass prairie for an example in uh, identifying these different components. Um, <clears throat> so indigenous people, fire uh, was an important, uh, or is an important component. I kind of said, I, I said was, the tall grass prairie is not, you know, they, about 99% of the tall grass prairie doesn't exist anymore. So the tall grass prairie has been one of the more threatened uh, ecosystems just because of the opportunity for, for production and, and uh, uh, dry land farming, irrigated farming, all kinds of things. That it's had all kinds of pressure and there's not very much of it left. And, uh, and fire is one of those uh, components that is no longer exists in, in the tall grass prairie, unless you went to the Tonsa prairie and they're, they're trying to bring some of that back, as well as um, the uh, grazing, uh, they're bringing buffalo back, so that uh, that grazing disturbance is important. They're bringing that back and they're trying to get all those, those three things that work together to maintain a grassland naturally, they're trying to get that going again, the uh, grazing fire, and then uh, of course the weather patterns, and, and well, I don't know if they try to rotate the, the buffalo very much, I don't think they have very much luck with that, they pretty, pretty much do what they want to do. <coughs> Okay, and then uh, I was I used these uh, the prairie dog as kind of a token, and, uh, and uh, as far as the other organisms, the other animals, the mammals that are important on those in that ecosystem, the tall grass prairie also, and that, as well as the predators and uh, predators, and maybe it wasn't just the coyote, uh, maybe the wolf at that time on the tall grass prairie too, but uh, probably had a very important role, in, and maybe they could control the buffalo somewhat. And moving them out of uh, riparian areas and those kind of things and keeping them, keep them moving. Okay, so then, uh, but what we did is we had a tendency to make things more simple, to try to simplify ecosystems, I think, Europeans when we, we settled. And so uh, started removing some of those uh, things from that ecosystem. So the indigenous people, uh, the grazing fire, is a delayed reaction to this. And then, uh, and then eventually predators. 
And uh, so, and then replaced those, of course, with, uh, the, and the reason I put Smokey there is uh, that represents that, I, maybe I doubled up on giving fire uh, credit, but just, just the protection of fire. You know, fire bad, <laughs> you know, but uh, back in the, uh, the early 1900s, that the, you know, the, the belief was that, no, we can't, if we're gonna protect these, Tall grass prairies, we've got to keep fire out of this. Fire can't be good. And so, not realizing that it actually did have a role in uh, sustaining the, that type of ecosystem, we protected it from fire. And then, um, of course, took out some of those areas with uh, the production, you know, with crop production. And then cities. It's coming. And then uh, highways, uh, interstates. And uh, these little um, ranchettes or 48 acre ranches. So that's changed. That's been uh, some of the biggest problems with um, and, and tall grass prairie and then the cattle that we produce now, getting all this uh, this feed that's produced in farms, putting them in feedlots, and, and uh, producing cattle that way. <coughs> okay, so. Um, <coughs> I want to talk about uh, managing ecosystems then, and with that, with that information, and uh, uh, try to, I guess, uh, discuss some of the things that I feel like I learned during the time uh, that I was at the Forest Service, and, and what I'm still learning uh, now. And uh, so, how do we go about uh, keeping these rangeland ecosystems functioning? So, I think, to me, that one of the biggest, well, the biggest uh, problem could be the loss of these open spaces, the loss of these rangelands, so the loss of watersheds and habitat for wildlife, and we, uh, we could have, uh, you know, some devastating problems. Like, you know, I think of the Dust Bowl days from around where I grew up. That's uh, it was pretty well concentrated in uh, northeastern New Mexico, uh, Oklahoma, Panhandle, Texas, and I think about all those changes that were made and uh, and almost the, the loss of those lands. Uh, so how do we uh, keep about the uh, go about keeping these rangeland ecosystems functioning? So I think keeping the rangelands, uh, these wildland habitats, and uh, keeping them open, uh, keeping these open spaces, and keeping them from, from losing them. Uh, you know, right now we think uh, they're well, they are protected by law. Uh, public lands are protected by law now. Uh, but you know, if there's if there's if there's enough uh, enough of an attitude and uh, urgency uh, from people, or people don't care about these open spaces, then laws can be changed, and you know these could be sold, and we could we could lose a lot of these open spaces too. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind: is just uh, you know keep that in mind and, and, and fight anything that would change. Uh, the ability to sell the public lands or develop public lands, or at least control it. Um, then keep all these ecological components that have, that, that characterize these ecosystems. So it's important to keep uh, scientists involved that are studying these areas and uh, understand what's going to happen if you decide to remove. I used uh, I used the furry dog for example, and you know keep thinking about what happens if you start removing some of those components from the ecosystem. <coughs> fire is actually a better example, I think. You know, one of the disturbances is trying, uh, removing fire, thinking that you'd be protecting the land better. And we know over time that what happened in some of the fire adapted ecosystems. And then uh, I think one of the more important things too is working together to do what's best for ecosystems. You just can't you know, uh, even in our individual uh, groups, our organizations, the Forest Service, uh, agencies, uh, we, can't, we can't do as good a job as we can if we have multiple uh, input, and especially the input from science. You need to, you know, people that are, uh, that are working, that have maybe spent their life working on uh, range by type ecosystems or even ponderosa pine ecosystems, they need to have a say in how those areas are managed, or at least some recommendations on how to manage those lands. Okay, so uh, 
want to do, I'm just going to break those down a little bit. Um, so keep the range lands open. I talked about that and make sure that, uh, you know, when you have a chance for, uh, to influence any of the laws that would allow a change in the classification of these lands, think about that and what the possibilities are uh, of losing those lands. Uh, so keep all the ecological components that have characterized these uh, ecosystems through evolutionary history. Uh, keep fire in these ecosystems that have evolved from long-term evolutionary history of fire. The grazing component in some of these ecosystems is, is equally important as prey uh, or predator-prey relationships are important in some of these ecosystems. And then uh, just and work together to, to, you know, respect each other and work together to uh, to do what's best for those ecosystems. And I, I used to, uh, I wanted, the initials are representing a couple of examples that I wanted to bring up. And I don't know if, uh, if any of you have worked with Bobby Holiday. I started thinking about that. I haven't seen her in a long time. And she was one of those, she was one of the people that was really instrumental in reintroducing the Mexican wolves. We worked on that. When I first started to work on the tunnel, she was, uh, you know, not long after I started on the tunnel, she started working on it and uh, was successful. And um, She was older than me then, and I think she's probably still older than me. So I'm not sure if she's kind of come to see very much of her. But Bobby was really an amazing uh, person. She got involved with uh, NEPA on uh, tunnel grazing allotments, and uh, uh, she got very involved, and she got involved with grazing permittees, and they, she got involved with the uh, disagreements and the controversy, and so she decided, well, these, these uh, ideas that these two groups have are conflicting, so I'm going to go back to school, and uh, she did a lot of work in trying to learn herself, and then so she came back and contributed, and really contributed well to these, these groups, and uh, she started going out with uh, the ranchers, the grazing permittees, and doing monitoring. In the beginning, they didn't want to see, they didn't actually, they were kind of nervous about having her around because she challenged them. And then uh, later on, they, they welcomed her because she was really good at doing some of the, the monitoring that they were supposed to be doing. So they, they worked together. And then she formed this group, and uh, some of you might have been involved with that too. She called it Six by Six. And she, uh, so she asked, uh, uh, a segment of environmentalists and a segment of ranchers, and then, of course, the, the Forest Service agencies. And they all get together, and they would, I don't remember if it was every two weeks, once a month, I don't think it was once a week, that they got, they got together and they had an agenda, whether it was going out and monitoring or doing a range inspection, uh, they, they all did that. And it really brought um, the, those two communities together, uh, brought, uh, uh, the outcome was, was better management on the, uh, on those rangelands on the National Forest. So it was really a positive thing. And I, I wanted to, one more thing is, uh, uh, I wanted to, uh, one of, well, uh, Dobson's, I know, probably some of you know, and uh, probably have worked with them. And I don't know if you know the story or, or agree with it. But, uh, is it Clint, uh, John Blank on his first name, uh, your permittee of the spring of that. Carrie. Carrie, yeah. <laughs> so Carrie Dobson had told a story, and it's just really interesting to me. I couldn't believe that he was, he was telling us. There's a long story that leads up to this uh, about the introduction of uh, Mexican wolf and the hardships that he, uh, that he felt like he had. And so I thought, well, this is going to be something sort of negative about the Mexican wolf. And it, it just kind of changed. He said, well, what I decided to do was I'm going to have to deal with this, and so I think I'm going to work with the group instead of working against them. And uh, he was telling telling the story to a bunch of ranchers, so it's kind of some pressure on him. I think he thought that was the story. And he said, so I decided to go uh, to Montana, where they had some had some workshops of uh, managers that manage in wolf country. And uh, he went to these sessions and uh, learned how to manage his cattle and his sheep uh, with the Mexican wolf. And uh, so before the wolf, he was getting you know was introduced. He he claimed he was getting maybe. Uh, 70 to 75 percent calf crop, 
And then he thought, you know, when the Mexican wolf was, was introduced, maybe he was getting a little bit lower than that because he wasn't really managing much. He went to these workshops, and then when he came back, he started doing some different things, managing differently. He had herders that stayed with the, with the cattle all the time, the cattle all the time, pushing them out of riparian areas. Uh, they didn't leave the cattle, and they pushed them to areas that were uh, where there was less uh, forage. And uh, uh, and then, of course, the sheep herders, they, they stayed with them anyway, but he would corral them, and he would, they would move them around and get a better job. So his calf crop goes up. Uh, to, uh, you know, maybe 85 percent. And so when he was asked, uh, when he was asked about this, would you, uh, if you had a chance to go back, would you want the, the Mexican wolf to be removed? Would you, want, would you, would you wish that hadn't happened? And he kind of didn't know how to answer that. He said, well, you know, I'm, I'm actually glad that they're there because uh, that made me step up my management. I'm doing a better job of management. Uh, I'm, it's, I'm more cost effective and it's, it's helping my overall production, the, pro the productivity in my carrying areas especially. So that was a good testimony for me. Whether or not uh, you verify that, that all those stories are true, I don't know, but uh, I don't know why you would tell that story if it was. It was really uh, pretty interesting. Um, so I guess uh, the, the last thing is involving the best science that uh, that you can involve, get uh, research science involved, people that are uh, experts in the field, and get bring in more people. The days of uh, single range con or single wildlife biologist, uh, somebody from Arizona Game and Fish Department, or the rancher, being able to do this by themselves, those days are over. It, they'll, they'll never be able to do that again. So welcome all those people and try to get the best information to make, uh, make good decisions. Okay, so I think that's uh, it for me.